and those who have come to join us tonight, those on live stream also who have, are members of our fellowship. This will be the 18th message in, on the coming of Christ. I trust that you uh, know this, but I want to state it just the same. That the purposes of these messages, the purpose of this, these messages is not just to give you some information and a, a word study and things like this. It's to confirm to your hearts the absolute necessity of being ready when Jesus comes. A person's life has been lived totally in vain if they are not prepared Amen. when Jesus comes. So that's, that's what's driving this series of messages. And I am, uh, I'm going to affirm in various ways throughout this series that much of the preaching of our time concerning the coming of the Lord is counterproductive. It doesn't, add, doesn't add anything to a person being made ready for the Lord's coming. There's just, it's just a, a lot of unrelated information. And much of it is not even accurate information. It has been read to you that our text is Hebrews 9.28, to, to them that look for him, as to anticipate him, Shall he appear the second time without sin unto or in order to salvation? <clears throat> now, I want to say a word about the scriptural use of the words first and second because there is a considerable amount of confusion on this subject, although there should not be. See, when, uh, uh, when novices and unlearned people get in the pulpit and get the writing pen, a lot of confusion results. This word, these words, first, second, these are not chronological words, like number one, number two, number three. They're not that, this, these are not that kind of word. For instance, the scriptures refer to Adam as the first man, the first man, and Jesus as the second man. Well, actually, there were billions of men in between, <laughs> in between. So this isn't a lot like number one and number two. It's it's not like that at all. <laughs> Those texts are found in First Corinthians fifteen forty-five. It is written, "The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first man is of the earth." Earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. There's also a first and second covenant. We read about this in Hebrews 8, 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then to no place had been sought for the second covenant, is the idea. Hebrews 9, 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in the worldly sanctuary. First covenant. Uh, Hebrews 10 9 says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, it's a covenant, that he may establish the second. The scriptures also speak of a first resurrection. Yeah. It doesn't say anything about a second resurrection, it says a first resurrection. It's found in Revelation 20 and verse 5. But the rest of the dead, Live not again until a thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That is the words first and second denote different orders or different kinds. The first Adam bore no similarity to the second Adam. They, they were two different kind of Amen. different kind of men. Amen. The first covenant was a different kind of covenant than the second. Second was a different order 
of covenant. They weren't, they weren't to say there's first order, second order, first kind of covenant, second kind of covenant. The first resurrection isn't like the bodily resurrection. It's a different kind of resurrection. And the second, it doesn't say second resurrection. Resurrection is never used in plural. Resurrections is never. See, there, the common doctrine is that there are yeah, that's right. yeah. two resurrections. They use this mm -hmm. text that the saints of God will be raised first, uh -huh. gap of a thousand years, yeah. then the wicked dead will be raised. Yeah. All the Left Behind series books teach this. All premillennial people teach this. It's a false doctrine. Amen. Amen. It's not true. There's right. one resurrection yes. consisting of two different kinds of people. Uh -huh. The first resurrection, which in this series of messages I will deal with more specifically, is a different kind of resurrection over which the no one, second death has no power over whoever participates in it. So it's a different kind of Resurrection in the resurrection of the dead, second death is going to have some power over some of the people that are that are raised. So first and second, first different kind. So it's Jesus to come the second time, it's a different kind of coming than ever was before. <clears throat> now the twenty-sixth verse of Hebrews nine <clears throat> says that once I say once. In the end of time, Jesus appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yes. Once. Amen. In the end of time, that is, this when Jesus appeared the first time, that commenced the last stage of the world. Yes. Yes. Amen. There's going to be another stage. Uh -huh. This is it. We're living in the last, yes. at the end. Yeah. Once in the end of the world. See, the end of the world, the world... It's a stage in which it's going to end, and Jesus appeared at the beginning of that stage yeah. to put away sin. <clears throat> During the last phase of time, there's not going to be any time after this work is finished. There was on Jesus had one and only one humbling condes condescension where he was made like men. Yeah. Only once. He wasn't an angel before yeah, right. that he would have had to humble himself to become an angel. So all the commentators, all the preachers, all the teachers that speak about Jesus having a first appearing in the angel of the Lord, these men are just simply wrong. There's no polite way to say it. This would involve the Jesus, the word becoming, coming in, in a humble, a humble form more than once. And it would have been very humbling for Jesus to become an angel. Yes. Yes. Angels are servants. Right. There is no indication Jesus was ever a servant yeah. till he put on the form of a, came in the likeness of a sinful flesh and for sending. We came as a servant, but he was no servant before that Amen. at all. So one time Jesus was made came in a likeness of sinful flesh and put away sin. Romans 8, 3. One time, that's all. One time he humbled himself and became obedient, even unto death. One time, that's all, one time. Now, as there are some things unique to this first coming. See, when he, once in the end of the world he appeared, that's the first, that's his first appearing on earth. In the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 9.24 that he is appearing now, yeah. but in, in heaven he's appearing in the presence of God for us. So there's three appearances. So one's going on now. One time he appeared on earth, and the second time is when he's going to come to earth the second time. Yes. <clears throat> now some unique things happened during this first coming or when he appeared at the end of time to put away sin. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like a man. He was tempted like a man. He had some liabilities of a man, like weariness, hunger, things of this sort. He's never going to do that again. He's not going to come as a man and sit on a throne in Jerusalem. He's not. 
that would require him to humble himself again. Mm -hmm. And redemption requires one humbling, not two. Yes. The removal of sin requires one humbling, not two. Mm -hmm. He was in the first coming, he was subject to temptation. Mm -hmm. He suffered being tempted. Yeah. He was tempted at all points like as we are. That's never going to happen again. But if he ever became a man again so that you could see him and touch him and shake hands with him, that would have to happen again. You say, what about after he was raised from the dead they saw him? Huh? That was a miracle that they saw him. That was a miracle that they saw him. Mark 16 says he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus in another form. He revealed himself. Yes, amen. Otherwise, nobody would have known who he was. Uh -huh. The two on the maze didn't know who he was. Right. They spent three years with him. They didn't know who he was. Why not? You see, he had to accommodate himself to the vision of men. When he said, touch me and feel me and see if I'm not real, he, he manifested himself to them. This is not, if he had been like he was when he raised from the dead, nobody had ever seen him. Yeah. Uh -huh. so he made himself known. To the people. When he came the first time, he was dependent upon God. Jesus was. He's never going to be in that state again. And if he ever comes to earth, the earth as this earth is, he'd have to be dependent upon God. Hebrews 2.11 says it this way. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. Jesus is never going to say that again. Everybody sees it. Oh, he's never going to say that again. He just said that when he came the first time. Now, I'm sure when he came the first time, it was a different kind of coming. Uh, he had a particular commission when he came the first time. He had a particular commission. It was this. <clears throat> Lay down your life and take it up again. That was sort of the, there are a lot of things that led to that, but that was the Bottom line, lay down your life. That means you had to survive all temptation. You had to keep yourself from sin. You had to maintain your contact with God. Lay down your life and take it up again. Specific commission. He will never do that again. Amen. He tasted death the first time. Once he appeared in the end of the world. He tasted death for every man. There was no other reason to come to the world. It wasn't to prove he was superior. He was already superior. Amen. Jesus has never been not superior. Amen. The devil knew it. Demons knew it. And they didn't even argue with Jesus. Huh? Demons didn't even argue with Jesus, let alone fight against him. They knew he had all authority. Mm -hmm. They knew he could come to torment them, and there wasn't anything they could do about it. Mm -hmm. Jesus has always been superior. Yes. He just appeared to be inferior. Yeah. Yeah. He's never going to have that appearance again. But if he came to earth so men could see him, <laughs> he'd have to have this inferior appearance again. First time he came, he bruised the head of the serpent. The way the scriptures teach it, he says he destroyed the devil. Hebrews 2.14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So in dying, he delivered the death blow is the idea. Satan didn't cease to exist, but Satan's, Satan's going to die of this mortal wound he received when Jesus bruised his head. Before Jesus left the region of the dead, he bruised the head of the serpent. That's right. And the serpent is in the process of demise uh -huh. right now. And soon he's just going, he's going to be just like anybody else yeah. in hell. He's not, going to, he's not going to be a leader in hell. Right. Yeah. He's just going to be one of the group. Yeah. Amen. That's right. 
Because Jesus came to deliver that blow. Uh -huh. And once the blow is delivered, there can't be any other enemies. Yeah. Jesus is the principal foe. Uh, the, Satan is the principal foe. Yeah. If the principal foe has a mortal bruise, there's no need to bruise anybody else. Yeah. There can't be some foreign armies that wage war against Jesus, not if the king of all the foreign armies is bruised and out of the, out of the picture. Uh -huh. Jesus, that's an absurd doctrine. It's not even suitable to read it to the nursery. He came, he spoiled principalities and powers. He plundered them. He took what they had gained and what they had governed, and he, he, took, he took it away from them. Colossians 2.15, and he... He spoiled principalities and powers in the cross. Amen. It was in the cross, yeah. not in Jerusalem and the cross, Amen. not in a war after he comes to earth again. In the cross, yeah. he spoiled principalities and powers that govern all the other enemies. Yeah. So the principalities and powers that rule over despots, if they're destroyed, you explain to me how the despots can still have power. Yeah. They can't. Well, this is good stuff, you know. I like to hear about it. He defeated death, which is the last enemy. There isn't any other enemy after death. And Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and said it was not possible. He should be holden by the pains of death. Death, death couldn't keep a hold of Jesus. What did that prove? He's superior to death. He defeated the last enemy. There isn't any more enemies to defeat. And he was exalted as a man in order that he might bring other men, many men, to glory. He's the man, Christ Jesus. But that's in heaven, not on earth. He's called the man, Christ Jesus, after he was exalted in heaven. There, it's in heaven that he represents humanity, not back on earth. And he came to deal with sin. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus will never again do any of the things I just mentioned. Yes. Amen. They were done once in the end of the world. And I want to underscore this. There are really no more foes for Jesus Amen. to defeat. Amen. He's defeated the devil. Uh -huh. And he's defeated death and what's left. Amen. Your neighbor? I mean, let's get serious about this. What's left after the devil, principalities, and powers have been destroyed and death? Pray tell what's left for Jesus to defeat. Amen. What other battle does he have to fight? What other foe does he have to face? He's already faced them all and soundly defeated them. Amen. Amen. He's not coming back Amen. to deal with sin. Amen. Coming back without sin, we might... Say, without regard to sin. Yeah, uh -huh. I say it that way. Yeah. He's not coming back to deal with issues of sin. Yes. He's already dealt with them. He's coming back to deal with sinners, <laughs> as Judah said. Yeah, it is true. He's not coming back to deal with sin. He's already dealt with that. He's dealt with it so, so successfully that God is fully satisfied and whoever acknowledges the Son, God will not impute sin. Blessed is the man to whom he will not impute sin. Why won't he impute sin? Because Jesus has dealt thoroughly with sin. He can't do anything more to deal with sin. And when he comes again, whoever's not ready, God's not going to deal with their sin. He's going to deal with them. Never again will he bear sin. Never again will he die for sin. Never again will he deal with death. When he comes with a shout, all the graves will empty. He's going to call out a shout. All that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Amen. Two kinds of people. Some under the resurrection of life, some to the resurrection of damnation. Huh? But single resurrection, one time when Jesus comes again. The arena of sin, the world, will be destroyed when Jesus comes again. So there won't be any, like, earthly Jerusalem to set up a throne in. There won't be any materials even to make a throne with. 
Because when the day, Peter said, when Jesus comes as a thief in the night, he, he makes that point as a, see, left behind series talks about thief in the night, make a big deal out of this. All right, when he comes as a thief in the night, the heavens and earth will pass away. So there's not going to be any more arena where sin can express itself. There'll be no no place where rebellion can be formed Amen. or where armies can be gathered. Yes, right. <laughs> there won't be any place, see. It could be destroyed. The tempter and all his hosts will be destroyed. Revelation 20, 10 and 15, 10 through 15 says they'll be cast in the lake of fire. And with them, death and the, and the grave are going to be cast into the lake of fire too. There isn't going to be any more death. After Jesus comes, nobody else will die. Amen. There'll be no more death. Yes. Amen. So pray tell, how can there be a war where there's people killed? Yes. How can this be if there's no more death? Or has, not, or has Jesus not destroyed death? Uh, yeah. That's the other alternative. Well, he has destroyed death. He destroyed him that had the power of death. So if him that had the power of death has been destroyed, how can people still die after Jesus comes? Right. How is that possible? Praise God, it's not possible. And the ultimate, the ultimate foe, which some are called the Antichrist or the man of sin or the son of perdition, or there's various ways he's referred to in Scripture we don't, the identity of this personality is not clear. There are many antichrists or little miniature antichrists, so to speak. But this, whoever this is, this is Satan's answer to Christ. This is the fabricated Christ like he's fabricated the church. And we're headed toward this time because it's the knowledge of God is kind of at an all-time low. And the world's about ready now for a fraud, for a, a fraudulent Christ. He'll just swallow it up. But when Jesus comes, here's what it says about this wicked one. Second Thessalonians 2 8, then shall that wicked be revealed, that wicked one it will be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of of his coming, Amen. not with not with a war, uh -huh. the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So here's this despot, deceives the whole world, looks like he's invincible, and all Jesus does now is show up. Amen. And the brightness of his coming melts the adversary. Well, this shouldn't surprise us. Look when God's feet touched Sinai, like yeah. to scared the people to death. Yeah. There was no insurrection at the bottom of Sinai during that time. That's right. yeah. Yeah. See, when he comes, the brightness of his coming. Now, I'm establishing now that when Jesus comes a second time, he's in no way going to deal with sin. He's, we know for sure he's not going to take away sin by another death. Yeah. He's not going to fight with sinners. That'd be dealing with sin. Uh -huh. He's not going to put down some armies of earth. That'd be dealing with sin. Uh -huh. yeah. He's not going to come to deal with sin. He dealt with sin once. Yes. And the way he dealt with sin was not by conquering sinners because that, that's a no-brainer a no for yeah. the Lord of glory. Yeah. To destroy sinners just takes a look yeah, right. or just takes to show up uh -huh. or just takes a flash of his glory and they're out. They're gone. It's an insult to Jesus to teach yes. that when he comes, going to marshal a bunch of armies, we're going to go out and go duke it out like the Christian crusaders did. Yeah. We're going to go out and duke it out. Some even teach we're going to buy it, do it on horses. We're going to, going to have old-fashioned warfare. Yeah. That's what they teach. But it's completely wrong. The angels are going to come with Jesus not to fight. They're not, they're not coming to fight. Yes. They're coming to gather. Yeah. Amen. That's right. They're going to gather the tares and they're going to gather the saints. See, yeah. they're, they're not coming to fight. Yeah. You know, the scriptures tell us that they turned up by the, by the tens of thousands at Sinai. Deuteronomy 
33.2 talks about it. He said, he said, the Lord came, this is Moses recounting God meeting with Israel at Sinai. He came from Sinai and rose up and see her unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and came with ten thousands of saints. Well, they didn't come to fight. These are some of the armies that other writers referred to. They didn't come at Sinai to fight. Well, that's ridiculous. For, them to, for angels to fight with mortals? Well, one angel could wipe out 185,000 while people are, while they're asleep. Yeah, amen. It's an absurd doctrine. Yeah. And they turned up at the flood, too. Yeah. Enoch prophesied about it. You understand Enoch's prophecy was about the flood, but it, it also was the same type of thing that's going to happen when Christ comes again. Jude 1, 14, Enoch also the seventh of Adam prophesied of these saints, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. So the, the angels, the angelic host accompanied the flood, but they didn't come to fight with humanity. That isn't why they came. And that's not why they're going to come with Jesus. Jesus has enough glory. He really doesn't need an army to fight for him. I hope everybody can see that. It's... Jesus has armies, but he doesn't need armies yeah, uh -huh, yeah. to fight. He's got all power yeah, amen. in heaven and earth. There isn't, any, there isn't any power he doesn't have. All of his enemies have borrowed power. Right. And it's all going to melt away when the king of glory comes. Amen. Jesus will not be dealing with sin, but he's going to come to abruptly terminate Satan's reign it's just going to stop instantly. Uh -huh. Sinful expression is going to stop yes. instantly. All forms of resistance and denial, yeah. rebellion, going to stop. Mm. All of a sudden, the rebels are going to be calling out for rocks and mountains to fall on them. Everybody's going to know there's nothing we can do about Amen. this. Amen. There's no way we can resist this. He's going to come see... He's going to come in all of his glory. Amen. In earth, when he appeared the first time, some of his glory was seen. It was just kind of an afterglow. It really wasn't a whole lot compared to what he possessed. And he's went back to heaven to have more glory than he had when he was on earth. He's been glorified, and no one will be able to contend with it. Sin has already been put away from the face of God. He appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin. Yes. Amen. See? Now, he's, he's revealed to those in his family that he's done this. Yes. He's put away sin. Now, if you, will, if you will believe this, sin will lose its power over you. Because yes. it really has been put away. Yes. This, this is not an exaggeration. Right. Or it's not a hyperbole. Is, this is the truth. He's put away sin, by the, not by a battle, by the sacrifice of himself. He's put it away. There's no need to put it away again. As far as God's concerned, sin's done. Yeah. Amen. Mm. Well, so, say, why do we have to confess our sin? Well, because this has to be, this has to be received. Yes. Amen. In the economy of salvation, what Jesus has done has to be believed yes. and received yes. and acted upon. Yes. The reason those who believe on the Son have the victory is because he really did do what he came to Amen. do. Right. He really came to put an end to sin yes. and to finish the transgression and to bring in everlasting righteousness. He really did come to do that. But see, if, unless a person believes that, they remain dominated by sin. But Jesus is not going to deal with sin again. I praise God for it. So if you want to, if you want your sin to be dealt with to your salvation, you've got to believe on the on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to believe what He did. You have to have faith in the blood. This is you've got to do this. It, you can't learn it any other way. If anyone, any, if you learn it any other way, it's going to be too late. <laughs> when Jesus comes, His armies will be with Him, but not to fight. Here's how it's stated in Revelation 19, which is a vision, you understand. 
Revelation 19, 14. The, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in all fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth, not out of their hands, yeah. out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule him with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's when he comes, he's going to speak the victory. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to speak it. Yeah. It is finished. Yes, That's it. It's going to be done. Amen. The armies are with him. They're just accompanying him yeah. to give him praise and glory. They're not coming to fight. Because there isn't going to be any fight. He's already done. He's already fought the fight. Everybody can see that, can't you? He's already fought the fight and won the battle. There isn't anybody he hasn't defeated. The devil's been defeated. Prince Pat's power been defeated. Death's been defeated. See, he's defeated everything that's needed to be defeated. So when he comes the second time, it's not going to be to deal with sin in any, any form. It only remains on earth. Sin only remains on earth. In the ungodly, yeah. uh -huh. it isn't anywhere else. Yeah. And it's that way because this is how God has chosen to bring the sons home to glory is through Egypt or the desert, yeah. through the desert. Uh -huh. He's chosen to bring us through enemies just to show you that what Jesus did is real. Yes. Just to show you that he did put away sin and he did gain the total victory. Just to prove to you he did, he's bringing you through the enemy's camp. And there's not a thing they can do about it. All you have to do is just resist them. Yes, amen. Hmm? Yeah. Amen. How is that possible? They've been defeated. They know it. They don't want you to know it. Amen. Satan knows he's been defeated. The demons know they've been defeated. They don't want us to know it. Mm -hmm. The things that are being taught in Jesus' name are taking that knowledge away from people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said, actually, we can help you with your problem. We, we won't call it being servants of sin. That's too strong for us. We'll call it addiction uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, or substance abuse. That's what we'll call it. And uh, we can help you with that. Bunch of liars. They're lying. They're not telling the truth. Sin's been defeated thoroughly. Satan's been defeated thoroughly. Anyone that does not want to be enslaved to sin does not have to be. Amen. It's just as possible as a lame man picking up his bed and walking. If you believe that message, it'll make good and glorious sense to you that when Jesus comes again, it will not be with regard to sin. If you're looking for him, the total reason for him coming will be to take you home. Yeah. That would be the total reason. Yeah. For the wicked, he's just going to come just to cast them in a lake of fire. Just a, It's kind of a, kind of a formality uh -huh. Uh -huh. type thing. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to their own place. They're, when Jesus comes again, there will be no one left to convert. Amen. That's right. yeah. The family will all have been completed. Now, while time still exists, is the time for sinners to be brought to repentance and reconciled to God. Repentance and reconciliation to God, conversion, being born again, being made a new creation. See, it's possible because Jesus did put away sin. His first coming was successful, 100% successful. And all heaven operates with this in mind, that what Jesus did is thoroughly adequate to take away your sin, take away the power of sin, purge your conscience from dead works, enable you to resist the devil. Jesus has done everything necessary for that to happen. That means he has had to defeat the foe. The preeminent work of this time involves preparing, not for the reign of the Antichrist, preparing for the coming of the Lord. And when he comes... There's not going to be any classes on warfare. Amen. We'll study war. Yeah, 
we'll study war no more. We'll say we're going to beat our spears into pruning hooks and our swords into plowshares. That's what we're going to get It's over. And you see that? Yes. It's a glorious truth. He's not coming yes. with regard to sin. He's not coming to have to deal with yes. sin. He's already dealt with sin, or else God would not have received him up into heaven. Yes. Jesus could not have ascended back to heaven if he had not done this, if he had not finished the transgression and brought in everlasting righteousness. He never could have went back to heaven because that was what he came to do. Well, I thank God for it. Brother Jason has our exhortation tonight.